Okay, good afternoon. Welcome back to our training session on access to remedies in Europe for corporate related human rights abuse. Um, I'm one of the organizers and I have to say I'm very happy to see so many interested people in this topic to join us for today. And this afternoon we are focusing on non-traditional remedies and we'll hear various perspectives on uh, especially company-based grievance mechanisms. Um, we decided in the, in the project we're currently conducting to focus on company-based grievance mechanisms as one form of non-traditional remedies. We already heard in the morning from Karin and you will hear later on in the, in the project presentation um, various forms of, uh, of grievance mechanisms, non-traditional grievance mechanisms. The reason why we decided to focus in this project on company-based grievance mechanisms is that there is still not a lot of knowledge about how these company-based grievance mechanisms work. They are actually also based on the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, they are directly based in this third pillar framework we already also heard this morning. Um, Raggy mentioned that companies should either establish themselves a mechanism where communities or individuals infected by company um, actions, whether directly or indirectly from doing business, or they should uh, participate in like a broader initiatives, maybe like a multi-stakeholder initiatives, as we also already heard this morning, like fairware associations. So, so um, the company-based Grievance mechanisms, they have this basis in the UN guiding principles. And during the last years, we've seen that a number of bigger corporations have started to develop such grievance mechanisms and tried to fit it to the criteria which was established in the guiding principles. But there was not much research so far on how this actually works. Um, how to best develop them, whether they are actually used by victims. And the research that has been done so far was mostly on US-based companies. And we thought that in this European project, it would be an added value to look at European-based companies and see how they deal with this new mechanisms, how they use it, whether it's a good mechanism, one that is actually accepted and used by stakeholders or where there is still need to improve or whether it might not work at all. And yeah, for this, for this discussion this afternoon, we will look a bit deeper into this mechanism. And I'm very happy to be joined here at the podium by real experts on this topic and to have various perspectives on it and so that we get an input from, from all sides, from all stakeholders who might be involved in such company-based grievance mechanisms. And what we would like to do in this session is to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of company-based grievance mechanisms, to look a bit deeper into how they are designed, whether the company-based grievance mechanisms that exist so far are actually designed in the way it was proposed by the RAGI framework or whether this vision even works. And we also want to discuss for which kind of cases this could be an option and where there might be possible limitations for using these company-based grievance mechanisms. And to do so, we hear all of your expert opinions. And without further ado, I want to introduce you to the great panelists we have here. First, Karin Lukas to the left. Um, she has a background in law, specialized in human rights and gender law. And she's currently a senior researcher and team leader at the Rudi Botsman Institute of Human Rights. And she leads the team on uh, human rights in business and development cooperation. In recent years, she has led two research projects on non-traditional remedies. One of them you will present later on. And so you have a lot of experience actually on this topic from a research point of view. On the other side, uh, Wolfgang Kraus, he's a CSR consultant 
and currently working with IPECA in London. It's the Oil and Gas Industries Association for Environmental Issues. And social. And social, <laughs> social and environmental issues. And uh, Wolfgang Kraus has also experience in working for a company with communities as a social and CSR consultant uh, with manager of OMV, uh, which is the Austrian uh, oil and gas company in various countries like Pakistan, Yemen, Libya, so very difficult issues also. Um, then we have Susanna Muscat-Gorska. She has also a legal background in international and European law and also in industrial sociology. <laughs> and she's currently working for the legal unit of the International Trade Union Confederation in Brussels and working and coordinating projects um, regionally and internationally on fundamental rights. Okay. And finally, we are very happy to have Jonathan Kaufman, who came all the way from Washington DC to join us for this discussion. Um, Jonathan works with Earth Rights International, one of the biggest NGOs uh, involved in, in business and human rights. And Jonathan has a lot of experience as legal advocacy coordinator for Earth Rights International in supporting communities to bring claims, but also known traditional remedies against multinational organizations in uh, Asia, Latin America, Pacific region. And um, in recent years, Earth Rights International has started to develop a new form of a non-traditional mechanism based on company-based grievance mechanisms called community-based grievance mechanism, and he will tell us a bit more about it. So to start with, I would ask Karin to give us kind of a state of, of the art <laughs> overview of what has been the picture on company-based grievance mechanisms, what can you say from your research, what are pros and cons, what has developed during the recent years. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Katerina. Um, maybe I should start with with our Bible on human rights and business, the UN Guiding Principles, and what they say on uh, company-based grievance mechanisms. They say that uh, to make it possible for grievances to be addressed early and remediated directly, business enterprises should establish or participate in effective operational level grievance mechanisms for individuals and communities who may be adversely impacted. Um, as uh, Katerina already mentioned uh, non-traditional grievan grievance mechanisms and particularly company-based grievance mechanisms are still a bit of a black box. We know they are out there, they are proliferating, they are more and more every day, but how they actually effectively function, uh, do they comply with the uh, principles of the guiding, uh, of the, the criteria of the guiding principles that I mentioned earlier this morning, legitimacy, etc., accessibility, does that really work? is still a bit of an open question. And uh, our research that, that we did at the Boltzmann Institute now for a couple of years tries to look at specific uh, mechanisms, international, like the World Bank Inspection Panel, uh, sectoral, uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives, like for example, uh, Fair Labor Association, and also company grievance mechanisms. And I will uh, talk uh, more about uh, those company-based grievance mechanisms, give an example. Um, so, these company-based grievance mechanisms are typically administered by businesses alone or with, uh, by businesses in collaboration with other stakeholders, for example, NGOs uh, and, and, and trade unions that act uh, a bit as, as brokers for the target groups, for those that should actually use the, the grievance mechanism. They, they may also involve external experts uh, to resolve specific issues in, in complaints, experts with, with hands-on uh, expertise on, on, on specific issues. This has, for example, been done uh, in uh, some large-scale dam uh, projects where in terms of uh, resettlement of, of thousands of people, uh, special, uh, specific experts looked at very complex issues of land rights and compensation and so on. Um, and it already came out a little bit this morning what non-judicial grievance mechanisms and 
of course, also company-based mechanisms should at, at not at all do is replace the judicial system. Uh, we've heard uh, the dangers uh, by, for example, Gubay mentioned that the dangers of uh, um, starting a procedure on a, in a non, on a non-judicial level that actually is time intensive and then may lead to uh, the judicial uh, avenue being closed because of, of, of time elapsed. So there are, uh, these are complementary systems. They cannot uh, replace each other. But there are good reasons, and uh, they were also mentioned in this morning, why the judicial system tends to be inaccessible uh, to certain groups of, of, of persons that are harmed um, structural issues, cost issues, and so on. Um, so the, the use of operational and company-based grievance mechanisms has grown in recent years significantly, both in response to this governance gap of, of the, in the judicial side, but also because um, of, of the business case. So businesses have started to address and avoid conflict with communities uh, especially with, with, with communities and community in terms of community relations, uh, to address conflicts early uh, in order to find solutions through these company-based uh, grievance mechanisms. There are also some uh, benefits for, for the potential target group uh, by these mechanisms. They offer recourse uh, and possible resolution at an early stage before uh, the issue, the problem becomes a fully-fledged human rights uh, problem and they are more accessible uh, to uh, those uh, harmed individuals and communities uh, because they are more flexible, they are um, uh, less restricted by rules of procedure um, and, and other substantive constraints that we uh, associate rightly with the usual court, court proceedings and we heard a lot about that uh, this morning in the morning panel. So, Ideally, company grievance mechanisms should be early warning mechanisms. They should point out at, issue, at issues that may turn into a full-fledged complex problem uh, that, that can be tackled at a very early stage and resolved in a satisfactory way for both uh, the potential or the actual victims and, and the company. And in many situations, uh, the problem is already so huge uh, uh, and so complex that uh, when the company mechanism kicks in, there, there are all sorts of problems. And we see this especially with community relations. So mining companies, uh, I can, I can uh, um, re refer to the case of Anglo-American. It's a big US uh, mining corporation. They have a grievance mechanism according to the UN guiding principles, beautiful on paper. All the criteria are met, accessibility, legitimacy, human rights compatibility, and so on and so on. So, I mean, you could tick off everything. It looks, it looks beautiful. Uh, but the region where the, the mechanism was set up by Anglo-American uh, was a mining site in, in South America where they had already big issues with the community there. Uh, there were issues of pollution, of, uh, of other human rights issues with this community, and then the company set up that me mechanism in order to try to resolve the issue. And there was just no trust by the community uh, in that mechanism, and it didn't work at all. So uh, beautifully set up, but no trust uh, because of the history of the company with the community uh, in, in that mechanism. So that now uh, they're trying to um, um, use or, or work with NGOs that have the trust of the communities and sort of can serve as intermediaries um, with the company. Another um, example is, so we have the, the, the area of the community relations. It's, these, are, these are very complex issues for grievance mechanisms. And then we have the aspects of workers' rights and workers' uh, relationships. So these are usually big brands that have suppliers uh, all over the world uh, with a corporate respons social responsibility, um, conviction, mandate, activities, and they say, well, our suppliers should follow uh, human rights, labor rights. And one of the uh, companies that we looked at, uh, a European company, Adidas, a big German sportswear uh, corporation, 
uh, that employs uh, over 46,000 people in over 160 countries and uh, with sales around $14 billion a year uh, and tens of thousands of business relationships. So it's one of these huge uh, apparel uh, corporations and they also have other brands like Reebok and so on, um, so they're really big. And Adidas has actually introduced for one uh, worker hotlines so that workers uh, in the suppliers factories can actually uh, contact a hotline and say, well, I have a problem with my wage, there's an issue with the canteen food uh, and so on and so forth. And what is quite innovative in my opinion about uh, this um, hotline system is that it's an SMS um, um, hotline system, so it's very, very easily accessible. Basically, every worker, it's been rolled out in Indonesia and other Asian countries will follow. Basically, every worker has a mobile phone and can send SMS. Um, I also talked uh, with, uh, with the IT person that sort of set up this, uh, this SMS system. So it's, it's quite well thought through with um, possibility to stay anonymous, uh, which is also very, very critical for such a mechanism. And then it is further um, looked at what kind of issue is it? Is it a big problem? Is it, for example, sexual harassment? Or is it something that is less critical, like canteen food? and then the speed of addressing it uh, is, is, is then applied uh, adequately. And there are two uh, independent NGOs that uh, are sort of brokering uh, also, they, they are sort of running the, the hotlines um, uh, and uh, like two NGOs in, in the Asian regions and, and one in Central America that are, that are contact points. And, uh, and Adidas then becomes involved if the issue concerns a breach of their workplace standards or a breach of international human rights norms. So this is, so this is the, 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 the worker situations of, of individual, more or less individual issues. And then there is uh, the third party complaint process that was recently set up by Adidas, which is more or less what we uh, understand by a full-fledged uh, guiding principles mechanism. So this um, process is a possibility for third parties, trade unions, um, NGOs to file complaints uh, to, to allege violations and these are mainly collective rights violations, so trade union issues, um, more, more systemic issues and one uh, of the cases, it's, it's, it's very recent standard so uh, there are not so many cases so far, but one um, a rather exemplary uh, case is one of a um, trade union, Taxif in Turkey, uh, that alleged that a supervisor in the factory had approached workers who were union members and su suggested that they resign from the union. Um, the trade union, because they had won more than 50% of the workforce as members, uh, then um, applied to the Ministry of Labour to represent the workers in the collective bargaining process. And uh, they also complained to Adidas that the factory had objected uh, to, uh, to them to represent the workers in the collective bargaining uh, um, negotiations. And Adidas met with the workers and the factory management. And as a result, uh, managers and supervisors were given additional training on the Adidas workplace uh, standards and, and particularly on the freedom of association uh, uh, standards and the respective supervisor uh, received a warning from the employer and Adidas also um, uh, encouraged the factory to engage in the collective bargaining process uh, and also said that the factory's objection to the collective bargaining were ups, uh, unsubstantiated. So this is, uh, this is um, in my view, a good outcome of a case, but there are also other cases where uh, another, for example, in, there's one in Cambodia where um, this, this brokering initiative between uh, workers, uh, trade unions, and, and uh, the employers of Adidas are not successful. So we see here mixed uh, results. Um, so these were just a few examples. What we see, so generally, as main issues or main problems are what I mentioned earlier, a lack of trust in the potential target group, 
uh, of the potential target group in this uh, non-judicial grievance mechanisms. Also, we have issues of accessibility. Adidas is, I think, the hotline system is a good example. It's quite low level. Uh, it reaches um, hundreds of thousands of workers in principle, but still more uh, can be done in terms of accessibility. And with transparency, we see also mixed results. There are companies that um, post the cases on their websites, the uh, reports also of, of other uh, trade unions that are involved. Uh, it's quite clear what the outcomes are, but there are other companies such as, for example, Gap, the, the big US uh, um, clothing company. It was, uh, I had interviews with them. It was very, very difficult to really find out exactly how many cases, in which areas, what were the outcomes, because they said, it's all confidential, we're sorry, we have to protect uh, the complainant so we cannot disclose anything. But, um, of course, confidentiality is very, very critical. The complainants have to feel secure in bringing the complaints, but it doesn't mean that basically the whole procedure uh, remains intransparent. Uh, that cannot be the, the, the goal of, of uh, confidentiality. So overall, in, in terms of um, effectiveness, uh, a lot still needs to be done, it's, it's especially from the victim's perspective, and we will hear more uh, about um, efforts of, of communities to, to present a, a, a model for, for a grievance mechanism. But it, it can deliver a lot in, within the limitations that it has. Um, that that uh, we outlined also this morning. It is a complementary approach to the judicial avenue and uh, with, with, a, with a, in a limited extent, but it can, in its limited way, address uh, very effectively, I think, certain labor rights related issues, but also community uh, issues. So um, I think there's a lot of potential, but uh, it, it still needs to be explored further. Thank you. Thank you, Karin, for this very good overview of this topic. I would like to turn to Wolfgang now. Um, a number of the big European oil and gas companies are members of your um, association. I would like to ask you, what are EPACAS member organizations' experiences so far? Uh, I know that a couple of them have established company-based grievance mechanisms. Um, what experience do they have in, in developing this process? What are, what are for them advantages or what are motives to, uh, to develop it actually? And what are their positive and negative uh, experiences so far with this mechanism? Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, I probably... Um, give you a brief, uh, brief uh, picture about IPICA. Uh, in the oil and gas industry, we have several associations. Uh, you would have the Oil and Gas Producers Association, which is more the technical side. And IPICA is actually uh, the part which is caring about the environmental side and the social side. So you have to understand the oil and gas business is a huge business, it's a very complex business. There are a lot of people working, hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Uh, and uh, so you cannot, you cannot say there is one case, there is one approach uh, because of the mere size of the industry. But I would like to share with you a bit, uh, the, the, I would say the span, a kind of historic span where it all started. Uh, for our member companies and I would like to give you at the end of this five minutes I think I would like to give you also a, a kind of personal uh, impression uh, where it will go. Um, first of all, uh, IPICA has about 38 plus minus uh, companies all around the world signed uh, and this means these are the companies who actually commit uh, to a sustainable and responsible business approach. So this is not a guarantee that they are not making mistakes, uh, but at least they have clear in their overall strategy uh, the key goal uh, to operate sustainable. Though we all know that oil and gas is not a sustainable product, of course. That's, that's the point, but uh, responsible management is another issue. So, uh, our members uh, are trying uh, to, to 
and, and, and now the historic point, where did we start? Where did the, where did the whole process of company-based grievance mechanisms started? Um, it started, ideally it would start uh, that you have a strategy and then on, on, uh, on basis of the strategy in line with certain international standards, you build up a model and then you immediately implement it, talk to all stakeholders and everything goes smoothly. No, this was not the case. Uh, in business, uh, business is very much fact-driven, incident-driven. Uh, if you open a little bakery, you do not care whether you will uh, have a big business in 10 years and you will spoil the neighbors. Uh, it's almost the same in every business. Uh, and so I would say that the, the, fact, uh, the facts, uh, the upcoming uh, complaints about human rights violation, the upcoming complaints of environmental uh, problems, this triggered uh, the oil industry to think about uh, and to work on these issues. So, unfortunately, uh, business is very much risk-driven. That's the first thing. So, uh, you have risk, uh, you have communities, uh, the communities protest, uh, they even shoot at you. Uh, this happened in Yemen when I used to work there. Uh, and uh, you have to manage these risks. And then you find out it's because uh, eventually you find out it's all about uh, the human rights aspects in the business. And then you have to deal with that. And at, at the beginning, and I tell you I studied in Vienna uh, business administration and I, I even wrote my PhD, but there was never the case of human rights. During all my studies I never heard anything about human rights, uh, apart from the law uh, that there was, they, they mentioned the law at, at the beginning of, of some session, but that's, that was it. There was no connex between business and human rights in these days. <laughs> this all changed dramatically. And this means all the managers trained in the last 20, 30, 50 years, they have to learn to deal with it because also for them it was new. Even if you were successful in certain parts of the world, uh, you are going into another uh, uh, part of the world and you fail because you simply cannot handle this. And uh, so risk-driven, one example, when I, worked, uh, when I used to work for OMV as the CSR manager, there was the case that OMV bought the company. They simply bought the company, it was a, a, a German company, and, and the German company had stakes in a company in Sudan. And OMV had never the plan to keep that. They, they just uh, got a package, they then analyzed what will I keep, what will I sell, but between the time, uh, between the analysis and selling the Sudan company, there were a lot of accusations, you are actually uh, the complicity in human rights violation in Sudan. And the management was completely shocked and, and they came to me as CSR managers, they said, tell me what it's all about, yeah, we just bought the companies, why we are uh, now uh, accused of being complicit in human rights violations. So, of course, uh, nowadays I would say the homework was not done properly. The due diligence was based, uh, first of all, on uh, mere business, uh, usual business things, of financial, of other legal things, but human rights were not considered. So, uh, this was then the story, how a management learned how to deal with that, and how did it happen? Actually, the management uh, and we approached human rights experts to tell us more about the story. So, that was typical, uh, kind of risk-triggered uh, action to change the management system. Okay, when we understood how to talk about human rights, what the implications are of human rights violation, the next step was establishing instruments to deal with this in the future. In the meantime, OMV sold Sudan, so this was not any longer a problem, and there was the clear evidence that we were uh, uh, neither, neither the, the, the reason for all of that, if this would have happened, nor did we want to continue this business at all. So, in the meantime, we had now the instruments, and with the instruments, we started to change the management system. Because that's the next thing. Uh, implementing grievance mechanisms 
should not be based on single decisions of a CEO or the opinion of a CSR manager. No, it has to be, it has to be anchored in the strategy. And only if it's in the strategy, then it doesn't matter whether the, we have a CEO number A or two or three, um, it's, it's part of the business. So when it becomes then uh, part of the, of the strategy, there are the advantages and the disadvantages. The advantages are clear. In the discussion with NGOs who sometimes uh, speak for uh, communities, uh, for in, in, uh, people affected by environment or other social um, issues, uh, the NGOs, you have a, a basis to discuss uh, with the NGOs uh, on basis of a management system, of a, of a system which should be transparent. That's the other buzzword. We have to talk about transparency. And that's the next important step because uh, some people, as, as you said, Karin, they have mechanism, but they are not transparent enough uh, or they are afraid of talking transparently. So, along this historic uh, cycle, we are already now, say, in, in, in the year 2000 now, uh, and in the last 10 years, I would say there started the way of multi-stakeholder consultation. So, companies were not any longer afraid of talking to NGOs. They were not afraid of setting up discussions, even on a global basis. Uh, companies and business people and managers, they learned that if you have an honest uh, approach, uh, if you really would, uh, would uh, establish a decent management system, if you uh, guarantee a transparent um, uh, approach, then the NGOs will not fight uh, immediately against you, uh, th they will start reasonable discussions. So, and, and when I talk about NGOs, I talk about really the huge uh, NGOs like Human Rights Watch, I talk about Amnesty International, and um, uh, the whole world, uh, t ten, 10 years ago, uh, they were considered to be the main um, organizations to challenge uh, business, especially oil and gas industry. And in the last 10 years, uh, I would say the, a reasonable dialogue has started. So, the negative side, the positive side was acceptance. Uh, the negative side, of course, is that still money and profit is a big driver. We should not underestimate uh, the, the profit of a company. Per se, the profit is nothing uh, negative. But imagine uh, you have a young gentleman who uh, recently married, he got three kids, he built a house, and he has a lot of loans, because of course he had not enough money at the beginning. So he wants to earn a lot of money, and bonuses are very well received, usually, by, by the employees. And then, uh, when he has a certain target to acquire certain stakes in certain companies, he might be driven more by his bonus than by the recommendation of the CSR manager. Because the CSR manager does not pay the, the rent for his house. So now we're coming to the human factors also in business. So the disadvantages are that you cannot hide certain things, which means that's a disadvantage of some of the people. For others, as for CSR manager, is great. Yeah? But for people who want to optimize their personal income, sometimes it could be a disadvantage because sometimes an acquisition can still not happen because going into North Korea to develop an oil field is today for IPCA members a no-go. Yeah? The, the, the exploration and production uh, member would see it probably different because there is a lot to earn. But of course, it's a no-go. So, and, and the, at the end, I, uh, 2015, where are we? I'm sitting for IPCA in the OECD, in the multi-stakeholder dialogue on local content. And we are writing at the moment a guideline uh, for creating local employment, creating uh, local suppliers, creating local uh, infrastructure, uh, gas uh, grids, electricity, streets, roads. We're talking uh, uh, mainly about Africa, 38 countries are there. We talk about Central Asia, Turkmenistan, Mongolia. Uh, 
they want to get something for their civil society and not only the royalties. They would like to get our management know-how, they would like to get our support in, manag in managing their problems. And here, and that's for me state of the art now, is that for the first time in this multi-stakeholder dialogue, uh, and this, this lasts now for two years, uh, there are NGOs sitting in all the discussions, like Transparency International, like others, you name it. There are the countries, there are the oil and gas companies, there are associations, and there is also the World Bank, IFC, and UNDP. All organizations who in the past thought they can do it alone. And now we are more to a team approach. And this team approach is for me personally uh, the, the, the positive side uh, to really make all these uh, grievance mechanism happen eventually. Hey, thanks so much for this first input. Um, I would like to turn now to Susanna. So we heard the company perspective, and <laughs> now we're going to hear the union perspective. What are the experiences from your member organizations? So local unions like, or national unions, um, what experience do they have so far with company-based grievance mechanisms? Where do you see advantages maybe for unions to come in? Where do you see the disadvantages of these kind of mechanisms? And where do you see the recent developments of developing such mechanisms in, in, in Europe? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, on behalf of the International Trade Union Confederation. Uh, the ITUC is a global representation of the trade union movement. We, through our affiliates, we represent 178 million workers in almost all countries worldwide, including 64 million workers in 44 European countries. Um, I would like to make some um, comments on the topic and then hopefully develop the argument further while we discuss. So, in a nutshell, uh, we see that uh, the company level grievance mechanism will, uh, if taken alone, will not cure the gap in access to judicial uh, remedy for victims of corporate abuses. We do see this gap. Uh, and uh, company level grievance mechanisms will also not cure the gap in mature industrial relations. Um, we unfortunately uh, operate in the system of destruction of uh, worker protection. Ideally, uh, workers represented by trade unions is an operational level grievance mechanism in itself, and so is labor inspection as it should be under the international labor standards, meaning labor inspection that has at any time access to the work site, more than police, uh, just can enter without any Warning, labor inspection that always protects the worker, even in case of the breach of migration status, and the labor inspection that covers all workforce, no matter how inventive the name for the worker is, self-employed person, posted worker, whatever. But this is unfortunately not the case. Uh, we as uh, trade unions, we document um, incredible um, intimidation of the trade union uh, leaders leading to, 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 to um, death threats, arrests on false uh, charges, uh, surveillance, name it, as well as uh, brutal changes in, in the legislation. I hope I will be able to, to bring some concrete examples. Uh, and also like the lack of enforcement of fundamental rights, including fundamental labor rights, is unfortunately a card played both by multinationals as well as many governments in the game of investment and trade. So in a way, the, the unprotected workers are left um, open uh, to, uh, we have to name it, exploitation uh, by the companies if they come and invest in the country. 
Um, so in this way, the most uh, vulnerable and poor workers are left at complete disposal uh, of often malevolent uh, employers who use the, the, the gap of, uh, of um, accountability. Um, so when it comes to, 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 the, uh, to the experience with the company level uh, grievance mechanism, of course, uh, it's, it's still like the, um, we have many different kinds uh, and many uh, mechanisms as, are named as grievance mechanisms. But uh, in, um, in, in the nutshell, um, we see a uh, not convincing record uh, of these mechanisms in terms of uh, giving the access to actual remedy. Uh, let's take the example of the compensation uh, for unpaid wages in the most um, um, serious uh, cases like forced labor or labor trafficking. It's really, um, um, it's, it's, in, it's still impossible to, to, to get a compensation for unpaid wages even in, 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 in the most serious cases. We don't see that these mechanism, uh, mechanisms have a big potential to lead to a systemic change for many reasons, including also this, this confidentiality. Um, um, but they, they don't really um, um, provide with, with guarantees for, for, for some systemic change in, 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 in uh, companies' um, behavior. Uh, very importantly, um, there is no clear evidence of including workforce in um, designing or uh, monitoring these mechanisms. So indeed they are often um, imposed from, from the, uh, like from the, from the top. Um, and uh, definitely uh, um, they, their potential to undermine existing collective bargaining structures is well recognized and it's not only by trade unions, it's seen in all the research done so far on, on the grievance mechanisms. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I'm very much aware that we'll be talking about the company level uh, and non-judicial mechanisms, but indeed uh, um, trade unions are more and more interested in, in uh, improving a regulatory avenue of ensuring business accountability, uh, even though the, the, the barriers uh, to, to the right to remedy are well recognized and we are aware of that, including the jurisdiction, choice of law, uh, group proceedings indeed, uh, or, or um, definitely the structure of the corporate group and, and, and lack of joint liability uh, schemes. So um, I think that our main um, um, concerns when it comes to the ideal <laughs> company uh, mechanisms, they, they do relate to their um, potential to um, undermine judicial uh, ways or uh, undermine uh, collective bargaining, um, their potential to reach into the supply chain and definitely uh, rights compatibility. So one of the uh, efficiency criteria from the guiding principles, um, which standard is going to, to, to be um, uh, used in a grievance mechanism, because the normal, the, the immediate uh, reply of the company is that we comply with the national laws, and if the country, if the if the um, if the state fails to transpose the, the the international human rights into the national system, that um, seems like the end story. So, so definitely um, um, ensuring uh, the coherent um, human rights. Um, um, outcome of the mecha of the grievance mechanisms is 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 the concern to us, and uh, as well as better transparency and and definitely protection against retaliation. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks also to you for this first statement, um, Jonathan. You also have experience and. Accompanying communities, individuals as NGO through traditional but also non traditional remedies. What are your experiences from the NGO side? Do you have uh, similar experiences as trade unions, maybe? And also, we would like to hear a bit more about this 
new possibility you are currently developing to develop uh, really community-based coherence mechanisms. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank the organizers and uh, uh, for giving me a chance to be here today. Also, I just want to thank everyone for speaking in English. I realize that I'm one of the very few people in this room for whom German is not the more comfortable language, if not the mother language. Um, and um, because Europe keeps on turning out people who your educational, social, and professional systems keep on t turning out people who are sophisticated enough to speak my language well, and my country does not return the favor. Um, thank you for, 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 for that. So just to appreciate that we're speaking in English, even though that's not the most comfortable language for most people in the room. Um, just very quickly, uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer with Earth Rights International. We are an international human rights and environmental organization. Uh, we're best known for representing communities in lawsuits and other legal actions against multinational companies for their involvement in very serious abuses of the human rights of indigenous communities, of traditional communities in different parts of the world. Um, but that's only a small part of what we do. Uh, we represent and accompany communities in various parts of the world when they have been the subject of, of, of abuse or, or human rights impact um, and assist them to find strategies uh, across the board that raise their voices and, um, and try to seek both remedy and accountability. Uh, but given that background of us being so deep into the accountability and remedy side, um, it might seem a little strange that I'm up here on the stage today mostly to talk about non-judicial um, and operational level company mechanisms. Um, mostly we're working in systems, we're working in the legal system where there's a very clear legal framework, or we're working in international accountability mechanisms where there's a very clear, if not binding, then at least guiding system of principles that, that, that are intelligible and understood and, and, and widely ex accepted. Um, the company uh, level grievance mechanism is a, is a very different context. Uh, so let me tell you a little story of how we got here, um, and then I'll tell you about our ideas for improving, improving the performance. Um, in, in March of 2013, I think it was, maybe 2014, um, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, <laughs> um, Earthrights was asked to visit a set of communities in the highlands of Papua New Guinea on an emergency basis. Uh, this is a, a place where a gold mine had been operating for the last 20 years, operated by first one and then a second Canadian mining company. Um, and over the previous six or seven years, revelations of absolutely horrific human rights abuses had been starting to come out, in addition to environmental devastation. Um, but the security guards of this company, along with police and, and armed forces who were sometimes in the area to manage unrest, um, were regularly attacking and killing uh, villagers who would sometimes enter the mine premises to steal little bits of rock, which they would then grind down to get bits of gold dust that they could sell in the market because they no longer could pursue their traditional livelihoods because the mine had essentially engulfed all their farmland and poisoned their water. Um, and then the security guards were also brutally raping women who would also venture into the mine areas either to do the same thing or even just because they had to cross the gigantic waste dumps of the mine in order to get to their homes or their farms. Um, this had been going on for a while. The groups, the local human rights groups and international groups who were helping them had attempted direct engagement with the company. Um, they had taken a case to the Canadian National Contact Point for the OECD guidelines. Um, all of these things were more or less in process and not really going anywhere. Uh, but we were asked to come on an emergency basis because the company finally, having been deeply embarrassed by a Human Rights Watch report about these abuses, um, as a, as, a, as a matter of damage control, had created a company-level grievance mechanism to address the instances of rape. Um, and the company was essentially inviting women to come and present their claims to um, a contractor, a third-party contractor, on a confidential basis. Um, and if the claim was accepted, they would be able to receive um, benefits from a list of benefits that the company was offering. 
uh, which included medical treatment and sometimes psychological treatment, um, assistance to set up small businesses in the marketplace to sell secondhand clothes or, or, or baby chickens, um, and school fees for children in some cases. And if the women were to accept that package of benefits, then they had to sign an agreement that they would waive their legal right to sue the company in the future, and in fact, to get involved in any legal action. Um, and the local advocates and their international allies were really concerned because suddenly things were moving quickly, and as, as Ingrid was referring to earlier, um, no one knew anything about preserving legal rights, and they knew that we had the possibility of providing them legal advice. So they wanted us to look into what are these women's legal options and what is going on with this grievance mechanism. We had never encountered a, a, a corporate grievance mechanism before. Um, and we arrived and, and looked into it, and we had a, a, a sort of a whole cascade of, of, of emotional reactions to what was going on there. On one hand, this is an extremely remote place, a country with a broken judicial system. Uh, the possibility of, of these women really finding some kind of legal redress was quite remote. And the grievance mechanism was providing something. Inadequate, yeah. Um, in some ways insulting at the, uh, in terms of the level that it was being provided. But there was the possibility of something. Um, so that seemed good and important. But on the other hand, the company was essentially buying legal immunity very, very cheaply. Um, they were creating a, uh, essentially a, a private remedy that they had complete control over, which they had consulted a bunch of very in eminent international experts on, but had not taken the trouble to sit down and talk to any of the victims before they designed the grievance mechanism. Um, and, and as a result, there was a lot of confusion and outrage in the community, but also a sense that they needed to take advantage of this because it was really their only option. And what we ended up doing um, as, as a first um, as, as, a first, uh, as a first ditch effort uh, was number one, contact the company and tell them that uh, they needed to start agreeing to suspend the limitations periods for any claims as a condition of any of the women entering this process um, because this process should not be used as a way to close down legal rights. Um, but then we actually accompanied about um, two dozen women in their going through the judicial process, through, through the, uh, the grievance mechanism process. And we sat there with them. Um, we uh, provided them advice in terms of looking at what the, what the agreed on written procedures of the grievance mechanisms were. We made sure that everything was going well. And we said, well, you know, we will assist you to interact with the company and make sure you, are, you understand every step of the process. And then when we get to the end, we can decide, you can all decide whether you think this is something that you want to be part of or whether you want us to help you think about potential other legal options. Um, and what happened afterwards is another story. Um, some of the women decided to accept the packages. Some of them decided they wanted to sue the company. Um, but we, we walked away from the process really intrigued by the idea of, of non-judicial grievance mechanisms. And to be clear, in some ways, this grievance mechanism broke all the rules in the sense that, number one, it addressed an extremely grave abuse of human rights. It wasn't about you know, land and, and water. It was about some of the most basic physical violations, violations of physical integrity and sexual abuse. Um, it was backwards looking, not forward looking. Um, it wasn't about building a relationship going forward or creating a mechanism to help early troubleshooting of problems. Um, but it was a form of grievance mechanism. Um, and we realized we were going to see more of these things. Um, as has been mentioned a few times, uh, it's in the UN guiding principles companies should establish operational grievance mechanisms. Um, it is, there are a number of advantages for companies and for communities. And we said to ourselves, well, if we're gonna be seeing more of these, um, how can we try to make sure that, uh, that a lot of the concerns that we have about this mechanism are fixed going forward? Um, and the answer to what, for us, was very clear. Communities have to come first. Um, where this is not the court system. It's not an imposed legal order. Uh, if, if there's going to be a private system for providing remedies, there's no reason why companies should be designing it unilaterally. Uh, because even the most well-intentioned company, when they set up a corporate-driven corporate mechanism, um, it's going to reflect their own interests and their own limitations. Um, whereas the communities as the rights holders in this, in, in this circumstance, they should be at the center of this. 
Um, and so we started to develop this project that, that Katarina has mentioned, uh, which we refer to as the community-driven operational grievance mechanism process as an alternative model to what we were seeing out there. Um, and we sought out the help of experts on grievance mechanisms. Karen is one of our advisors, and we've really appreciated her assistance and participation. Um, we went to uh, some of the most well-respected grievance mechanisms, uh, including the Fair Food Program of the Committee of Anamakali Workers, which I'll come back to in a bit, um, to, get, to get the best ideas. Um, and uh, kind of to, to, to reflect a little bit on what Susanna was saying, um, for the most part, we were concerned with communities in the area that are impacted by, by projects. Um, because there is no international framework for them, uh, there is a very well understood international framework for labor rights, although it is very often poorly honored by, by the powerful. Um, but for, for us, we were working particularly with, with, with in, in affected communities, um, although there's no reason why this model would not also incorporate workers as well. Um, so what, did, what would it mean to put communities first? Um, in our conception, uh, one of the reasons why the mechanism in Papua New Guinea was so contentious and so inadequate um, was that the communities had no faith and no understanding of the procedures that were being presented to them, they were imposed. Um, they also had, uh, sort of like the Anglo Gold example that Karen gave, they had no trust in the company itself. So anything that was coming from the company, they were not they were not going to believe was in their interests, even if it were designed in a reasonable fashion. Um, the remedies that were on offer looked nothing like what the remedies would be in their culture. For them, they were being offered essentially development assistance when what they needed was something that would make them whole for having experienced some of the most brutal acts that can be perpetrated on a person. Um, and they told us that in their culture, that would be dealt with uh, by a gift of money or pigs. So giving money or pigs doesn't look much like helping someone set up a business in the marketplace. Um, and the, the company had gotten advice that, oh, you want to put them on a sustainable footing. You want to help them start a business. Um, and also, they were also told women in this culture can't receive compensation. It will be taken by their male relatives. Turned out that really wasn't true. Um, so there was this complete mismatch between community expectations of what a remedy should look like and what the company was prepared to give. Um, and, um, and also, the company not only needs to, uh, the community needs not only to understand and, and, and have um, a say in um, who is determining what happens in this process, but how it's done. Some communities are consensus-based communities. They expect um, a determination on a particular case to come out of discussion and, and consensus building. Some um, might be more driven by the decisions of elders or respected, respected leaders. Um, others might be looking for a neutral third party. Um, so again, all of this had been imposed on these communities rather than being the product of discussion. So in the community-driven model, it's communities that essentially come up with a design for themselves and that becomes the basis for, um, for a discussion with, uh, with, with, with the company that eventually has to Im implement it. Um, a couple of other really important aspects of design that, uh, that are really thorny and really difficult. What is the interface with the formal judicial system? I think we all recognize that um, an operational grievance mechanism is not a replacement for a functioning judicial system. Obviously, in places where there's a tremendous governance gap, the existence of an operational grievance mechanism may be more important, but how, uh, what is the interface? Preserving legal rights is one thing and, uh, and was fundamental. Um, but for example, if there's an investigation in the course of a, of a grievance mechanism complaint, um, the facts that are, that are created there, um, if it's not resolved at the company level, how, how are those facts going to be treated in an eventual judicial proceeding? Um, uh, do, do communities have some kind of independent legal advice from the beginning to make sure that they're not waiving rights or that they understand how to proceed from one stage to another? Um, all of these things uh, need to be the subject of conversation negotiation and, and, and need to be resolved in a way that satisfactorily protects community rights and expectations. Um, so we designed this model, we researched existing grievance mechanism, so we researched, we researched other community-based tools for protecting human rights like community-based human rights impact assessments, community-based impact benefit agreements, um, biocultural protocols, 
um, and, and tried to pull together a conceptual model, um, which is described in the article that, is, that there's a link to in, in your packet. Um, but we said we also need to see if this works. Theoretically, this sounds great, but it's also going to be really difficult. Um, and we need, to, we need to find a pilot. Um, and so there's a pilot. Uh, this is now being rolled out and developed with a group of communities in Myanmar, in Burma, um, in the context of a special economic zone. It's not an extractive project. Um, it's a, it's a, an area where the government is promoting investment by creating a special zone. Um, it's a complex context because there are quite a number of companies invested there, but on the other hand, there's an actual structure to deal with. Um, it's, a, it's a country that has a tremendous issue with governance and, and, and integrity of the judiciary, but is also looking to try new things um, as it opens up to the world. Um, and we had communities that were in the process of being displaced. So in some, they had some past grievances to be resolved, but also they knew that they were going to be dealing with um, investors in their midst for the coming decades, and that there would be labor issues, there would be environmental issues, and potentially others as well. Um, and uh, we've now been working with the community, communities at Thielawa for over a year. Um, we first explained to them the idea, and they were particularly excited because it turns out that even though this is an abstract process, and you would think most communities don't have a lot of uh, practice with de designing process, um, they certainly understood what it's like to be subjected to a bureaucratic system that they have no control over. Um, and they did not want to be in that, in that position. Um, and so the communities have been working slowly to understand and in an inclusive way within the community um, identify which remedies, they, which issues they think are, are appropriate to be handled in a non-judicial grievance mechanism, um, and then what the procedures should be to handle them. Uh, the SEZ, the, the Special Economic Zone Management Committee, has in a, on a provisional level accepted the idea that this is going to be the starting point for developing a grievance mechanism for the zone. So we have a certain level of buy-in from the government and from industry stakeholders. Um, and we're, we're kind of in the middle. We don't know where it's going to go, but at the moment, um, at least everyone's open to the idea. Uh, and it, and it's, it's, it's been interesting because on one hand, you might think, why would a company accept from, a, from communities a design that doesn't necessarily respond to their interests when they're the ones who have to implement it? But from company representatives that we've spoken to, many of them have said, you know, for those of us who actually are serious about community engagement and think that's important, one of the hardest things is knowing what does the community want. Because a community is a complex entity. It's not just one interest. Um, and, you know, we try and please them in one way, and then it turns out that we've run afoul of them in another way. So if you're actually saying that you will be able to present to us uh, a comprehensive understanding of what the community expects for how grievances are going to be settled, we'd be very excited to hear that. We can't promise up front that we'll accept everything, but yes, this is a great initiative. Um, there are tremendous challenges. Capacity is always an issue. Um, it's taken already over a year, and we're not done designing. Um, and thinking about extending this to other contexts, it's not always going to work. You're not always going to have a community that is organized enough that can dedicate enough attention to developing, developing process. Um, there's always, you know, we're, we're, we are fortunately in a situation where there's not already a very bad relationship between the companies who are coming in and the communities. Um, when there is already mistrust, um, on one hand, this might be a way to build that trust. On the other hand, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge. Um, and then there remains the question of, are grievance me mechanisms actually appropriate for the most serious abuses? Um, and we feel, at Earthrights, we feel very conflicted about this. Um, I think we would like to be able to say, no, you should never use a non-judicial mechanism for something really serious, but tell that to someone in the highlands of Papua New Guinea who, um, there's a courthouse there, but there was no judge for an entire year. Um, so I was asked to opine on it. Is our model the wave of the future? <laughs> um, I hope that it is to a certain extent. Um, I do think that this is where a lot of these human rights protective tools are going. They're moving towards more community ownership and, and recognition that it's not just the outcome that needs to be protective, it's the process. Um, and that you don't get consistently protective outcomes unless communities and affected stakeholders have been uh, involved in, in the development of the process. Um, Again, I don't know if this is going to be possible in all contexts, because it turns out that it's quite intense. 
um, and quite difficult. But we're hopeful that as we develop experience, we're going to be able to assist by developing tools that will enable communities and their advocates and assistants and, and consultants to, to do this. Um, it remains to be seen if grievance mechanisms can handle the full spectrum of human rights issues. Um, it may be the case that this works better in a more forward-looking context and not in a backwards-looking context. We don't know yet. Um, but the example that we have in front of us that gives us a lot of hope is uh, the one that I mentioned a bit earlier, the Fair Food Program of the Committee of, of Immokalee Workers. Uh, this is a program in Florida, in the United States, um, among tomato growers. Um, and for those who don't know, the agricultural sector in the U.S. is, uh, is it's, a, it's, it's a very rough place to be, especially for a migrant worker. Um, and the levels of, of, of abuse of fundamental worker rights, as well as sexual abuse, rape, sometimes violent assaults, um, has been spectacularly high in, the, in, in sectors like the tomato growing sector in Florida. Um, but uh, the, the workers organized themselves and it took years for them to figure out exactly how to do it, but they were able to set up a system, stakeholder-based, not imposed by companies, but eventually accepted by some of the biggest tomato buyers in the country, uh, the Walmarts and the McDonald's and the gigantic chains, um, that requires all growers to abide by a worker-developed code. Um, and if they do, then they can charge a little bit more for their tomatoes. If they don't, then there are various sanctions which range from not being able to, being publicly called out, not being able to charge the extra surcharge and having violations referred to the judicial system. Um, so it's possible. Um, you need to be smart and persistent and engage and use leverage. Um, but we see this as a really exciting way to fix some of the very basic trust and gap issues um, that exist with non-judicial grievance mechanisms. Thanks. Well, thanks, Jonathan, and thanks to all four of you. I think it was very first, uh, very interesting insights from, from all your practical experience. I just want to return to some of the points you, you mentioned. And um, Karin, uh, Susanna raised the very severe criticism, actually, and, and also accusation of uh, company-based grievance mechanisms that they are, in a way, undermining uh, industrial relations, that they are undermining uh, the proper judicial system. Was this something you also observed in, in your research, that there were examples where actually unions were prevented from interacting with companies on, on the usual industrial relations and also did you see maybe positive examples where unions were well involved in a process and it could actually strengthen industrial relations mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, I actually wanted to reply to that myself because it's 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 a very pertinent uh, issue that Susanna raised, um, and it's it's a very complex issue. Um, on the other hand, on, on the one hand, uh, when I uh, did research and also like auditing with uh, with companies, the corporate social responsibility road and uh, um, the labor relations road there. They, they usually didn't go together. So these were c completely different kind of departments. When you, when you talk to the, the CSR manager, uh, you, you talked maybe about some internal human resources things, but, but you talked to the uh, uh, workers' council person uh, when you wanted to talk about, about uh, labor rights issues. And now with, with some of the company grievance mechanisms, when we look at, at the whole system of, of those uh, mechanisms that we looked at, actually there was, um, in, in, in some countries where uh, union rights are, are severely um, uh, in danger, um, both because the state doesn't care or the state um, actually goes against uh, union rights and it, the employer side is very hostile. Um, we found that, uh, in, for example, in the case of Adidas, that, but that may be just one example, that uh, the, the brokering between um, the, the, the unions 
and, and the factory owners through Adidas actually led to a result where the unions were strengthened. And these, these were actually channels that the unions used themselves. They, they actually made those complaints them, themselves. They used that new mechanism to uh, seek support for their cause. Um, but this is a solution for factory X in country X. So the more systemic issues that you pointed out, um, they need uh, involvement of the employers at, at the place where things are happening. They need the engagement of the state. And this is actually the main actor in, in this field. Uh, the state must ensure proper legislation and proper uh, implementation supervision. You, you mentioned the labor inspectorates. Huh? Uh, in so many countries, the labor inspectorates are underfunded, uh, undermined in every possible way. So what, what I see as potential danger is that, that we look at the development of this company and non-traditional grievance mechanisms much more than we look at uh, the sort of more traditional state uh, mechanisms that are so, so necessary to, to protect labor rights. And uh, we were talking about resources this morning. This is also, these are strategic decisions. These are resources decisions. And, and we must be very careful not to divert very, very important also financial resources, but also uh, capacity building know-how away from, from states and trade unions uh, to uh, grievance mechanisms that, that, that can not address systemic issues in the way that we want them to be addressed. So this is a very, very critical issue. Um, what I think is also increasing, but uh, would be good to have more, is that the grievance mechanism, the multi-stakeholder initiatives where NGOs, trade unions, and companies work together, um, and other grievance mechanisms um, engage more in a dialogue. I've had one case, the Golkadas case, where actually um, a, an employment issue was brought to the Fair Wear Foundation, but they were not competent because it was not their company. They referred it to the Fair Labor Association, another multi-stakeholder initiative, and at the same time, a trade union brought the case to Adidas because they were also members of the Fair uh, Labor Association. And I think a, a more, so there are a lot of linkages. Um, and I think more dialogue between those um, mechanisms would really, really help to also address more systemic issues. Otherwise, we end up really having some good solutions for some factories in some countries. And this is not satisfactory. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to turn to, to Susanna now. Um, You've been very critical about company-based grievance mechanisms. Um, I wondered whether you would still see a role for it. Um, for which cases, or if, if at all, <laughs> you could imagine to have company-based grievance mechanisms? And where would you see the role of union, of trade unions in these cases? What would be the, the, the ideal role of, of trade unions in an ideal company-based grievance mechanism. Mm. Um, um, I'm used that uh, I came so <laughs> harsh. Uh, uh, it was not uh, that much of my intention. I mean, definitely uh, there are um, substantiated critical points uh, that we see, and it's not only trade unions that raise them. But uh, company grievance mechanisms is the way to, to go in a, in a I mean, this, um, the, the, the added value of uh, flexible negotiati negotiating um, um, outcomes that, that uh, are um, more close to mediation than, than adjudication, there is always a place for them. And there are ways in which grievance mechanisms, operational level grievance mechanisms uh, will not uh, under, undermine or endanger collective bargaining, giving a couple of examples. I mean, definitely if there is a grievance mechanism in a collective agreement that is uh, enforced in the, in, the, in the company and uh, when there is a new grievance mechanism created, sort of uh, as an as a alternative or a bypass, there, there is a problem, but that does not have to be the case. Um, developing or updating grievance mechanisms at the company level can be done and should be done 
in dialogue um, and in negotiations with workers' representatives, be that unions or other workers' representatives. But then there is also the question who the worker representative um, is or should be. And we have the international labor standard on that, Convention 135, uh, meaning that this uh, should be, there should be um, representatives who are freely chosen by the workforce that are protected against sanction, against dismissal, uh, that, I, that, are, uh, that they are given means by the company to operate, to represent workers. Um, so um, definitely uh, mechanisms that are developed, it's very much um, mm, compatible with what uh, Jonathan raised uh, in terms of the communities. Um, um, if the, the, the procedures are uh, designed uh, and enforced and uh, monitored uh, in dialogue uh, with uh, the, the workers and the representatives, it's only the, the improvement that can be expected. Um, but there also there should be like concrete um, safeguards for that, uh, as well as there should be the safeguards uh, for the uh, company mechanisms not to undermine uh, judicial ways. Uh, and just take one example, the, 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 the records to, to, to judicial um, path should always be open at, at, at any time of, of the procedures. So uh, yeah, I think the devil lies in details and definitely there are ways to, 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 um, to create um, mechanisms and frameworks for better protection of workers' rights. Thanks a lot. Um, Wolfgang, um, you mentioned yourself that very often companies' actions are incidents-driven, and we also, I mean, most of Susanna's criticism was also targeted towards the company just tries to make the best out of a bad situation for themselves, uh, kind of condoning the damage uh, but not paying much attention to find maybe sustainable solutions. Um, during the last years, as you've seen, that some of the member organizations, I know that you have not been directly involved in, in signing it, but maybe you can bring some experience from member organizations now that they might have learned that they need a longer term approach to also engage with unions, to engage with uh, NGOs, with maybe also local communities. Um, what strategies have they developed to integrate law awareness, awareness about uh, human rights issues, environmental issues, to kind of have a proactive approach and rather than a reactive one? Yeah, as I mentioned in the last 10 years, I saw an, an improvement in the overall situation uh, accepting uh, this, uh, this topic as an important one for management decisions. So um, I have brought something with me, which is uh, uh, the community grievance mechanism, a manual uh, for implementing operational level grievance mechanism. Uh, that is a kind of, of guideline for our member companies. Uh, we will provide you with a link, so it's actually, uh, it will be visible for all of you. Uh, and this is a kind of recommendation to our member uh, companies uh, to start with a decent management process in this respect. So that's the thing. Uh, we have a kind of best practice manual which we offer member companies uh, to use. Um, I, would, I would like to distinguish, as we heard in the discussion, there are the two things. There are the, uh, the employee-driven uh, grievances, uh, and there is the community-driven uh, uh, side. Um, and, and I would like to share with you uh, some experiences, which makes it not easier uh, to answer the questions. Yeah? Because the business sometimes uh, is confronted with situations uh, of reality, which is not pictured in any theoretical or uh, 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 setup or any law. Uh, Take uh, my experience was Libya, uh, Libya, uh, uh, say year 2000. Uh, a lot of oil, a lot of oil business, uh, actually a wealthy country, uh, actually no social unrest, 
uh, despite the fact that Gaddafi was ruling uh, the country with an iron fist, as we said. Uh, and of course, uh, unions and other institutions were not allowed at all. And you come now as a, a company from Central Europe, you operate there and you ask then, uh, the first question would be, you go to your local uh, NGOs or, or human rights experts in Vienna and you say, what should we do? Yeah? Uh, the law is, is, is saying this, international law, but they don't care. Uh, but the business is there and the people would like to work and the people would like to earn money. So uh, there are also the sometimes then solutions a bit out of the box. So uh, there was a recommendation from human rights uh, experts and even from ILO representatives that uh, try to apply non-informal uh, mechanisms. What was the non-formal uh, uh, mechanism in, in Libya? For example, uh, we organized, the management organized a monthly birthday party, which means after the usual uh, working time, five o'clock, uh, we invited the people uh, from our office together, together in the office uh, rooms, uh, to have a little party officially to um, celebrate the birthdays of the people who had birthday in the last month. But after this official ceremony, uh, congratulations, and you get a basket of fruits and some flowers, uh, the management disappeared. And there were just uh, some, some, some middle managers there, local people, and we advised them uh, to talk to their people openly about the problems which they have, about complaints which they have, about wishes which they have. And these people uh, then uh, put the, all these things on a list uh, and then discussed it vis-a-vis -vis the management the other day. And this was so much appreciated, you cannot imagine. Yeah? This, uh, this lasted for some years, was very much appreciated by all the participants and was a kind of uh, very special uh, for us a grievance mechanism because otherwise we would have th been thrown out of the country at all. So that was a point uh, about this uh, side of, of uh, the, w the workers. Uh, the community um, is uh, in the oil and gas industry more of a problem. Uh, why more? Because our workers are very well paid. Uh, I'm looking at you, I think you will know that. Uh, uh, oil workers are very well paid. Uh, and uh, all the people, if you go to Yemen, Pakistan, you name the country, everybody would like to work uh, for the oil industry because we have high safety standards, security standards, and we have high salaries. So this uh, is for us not such a problem as for mining or uh, other, other industries. But, of course, we have the community problem because for, uh, if, you, if the government uh, thinks they have oil, uh, it's not always somewhere in the sea, it's already uh, under the village, under a town, and then it's all about relocation. And that is then the thing when it really starts to be very difficult, uh, because uh, 20, 30 years ago the government told the people just to go. They compensated them in, in one way or the other, but but, or not at all, uh, but definitely not on basis of international standards. So that, that is really an issue which uh, turned in the last couple, uh, I would say in the last 10 years, uh, especially in the oil and gas industry. It was a big driver uh, to change strategies uh, and to cooperate with NGOs. So here I would say uh, um, uh, responsible uh, operating company would very much um, cooperate in cooperate in in case of relocations of communities uh, with all stakeholders involved government local district civil society and and you said it also uh, it's sometimes difficult to establish who actually speaks for the community not, uh, I had this in Turkey, we built a huge gas power plant uh, at, at, at in, in close to Samsung, uh, and the mayor thought he's the person we should talk to, uh, because he was 
democratic elected mayor. Uh, on the other hand, hand uh, the, the, the boss of the local school, he thought he is the key person. Uh, and then there was, was the local mufti, uh, and he thought from the religious point of view, he is the person we should talk to. So you have to be very careful. You have to really learn from experienced NGOs. Uh, you have to go with people who have done this already. Uh, but one thing, to, to cut this short, I ex uh, and, and I've been uh, to Iraq to establish this mechanism before we touched the ground even, uh, we established this, these mechanisms in northern Iraq. I never, I never had a community who acted unreasonable. And I was in New Zealand and I, made, I, I had these negotiations with the Maoris and in Pakistan, in Libya, in Iraq, in Yemen, you name it. I never ever had a, um, a community who argued unreasonable. So, uh, so you see where I'm coming from. <laughs> Thanks. Jonathan, you mentioned uh, that companies uh, told you that your work is very valuable for them because it's very difficult for them to reach out to communities and so your work gives them the possibility to hear what the community is actually interested in, which sounds very reasonable to me and, and, and very obvious, but still I wondered whether it was really so easy to convince companies. It's, as you mentioned, a very long process. You don't know the outcomes. It's a mechanism which they can't really, it's not in their hands, they don't know how it will proceed and, and will be the outcome. So how can you actually win companies to participate in a community-based grievance mechanism? Well, even just the pilot is still a work in progress. Um, and I'll say we, we, chose, we chose this particular context, both because the communities were eager to do it and because some of the we thought certain elements were in place that would make it more attractive for management to to be to be open to this. So uh, I won't say it's an easy case because it's certainly not an easy case, but it's a place where um, where there are quite a number of reasons why the government and business stakeholders are are interested to have this problem solved for them. Um, but I also mentioned the, the Fair Foods Program, the the Immokalee Workers Program, which only came about after about a decade of campaigning. I mean, real and really smart and hard campaigning. Um, and you know, they were they essentially used the power of of, of consumer boycott against Taco Bell and McDonald's um, before they were able to get the first company, the first major tomato buyer, to sign on. Um, and so that was that was tough campaigning. And they because they had a a program that that it was not it didn't seem to be at all in the interests of the tomato farmers. To, to bring it on, and they cared little what the workers had to say. Um, and they didn't believe that migrant workers could organize. So, and they were wrong about that. Um, so, I mean, the, the answer is that we do believe that we have value to offer here, um, and that there, there, there is reason for companies at least to be open to listen. Um, we generally assume that no company is going to agree beforehand to a mechanism that they haven't yet seen, but at least to agree that this is going to be the basis for a discussion rather than them coming up with a process and saying, boom, this is what you have. Um, but I mean, as advocates, we are used to using the leverage that we have. Um, in the case in Papua New Guinea, um, the, whatever positive outcomes came out of the grievance mechanism there were largely driven by a fear of litigation. Um, that's probably in the end, that plus reputation control are the reasons why the company set up the grievance mechanism in the first place. Um, the outcomes of the, of the process were pretty poor um, and some of our, our clients decided that they wanted to sue the company and the company in the end um, decided to meet their demands rather than to, uh, rather than to face a lawsuit. Uh, and then after that, the rest of the women who had gone through the grievance mechanism process and had accepted benefits and had waived their right to sue looked and saw that the handful of women who had decided to stand up and, and go forward with a lawsuit had, uh, at least they believed, had come out better. 
Um, so then they went back to the company and said, well, that's not fair. I mean, this kind of gets back to some of the conversations from this morning about, you know, you can only bring a lawsuit on behalf of a relatively small number of people, but there might be other similarly affected people. They came back and said, this is absolutely unfair. Why should those women get more? Um, and in the end, the company actually revised its benefits package upward because they exercised people power, essentially. So they had gone through a grievance mechanism, were dissatisfied with the results, and then used the power of popular pressure to, to, to make it turn out better. Um, so it's, a, it's really a combination, you know, in this sort of, in this business in human rights world, and we're always trying to figure out how to make the business case for human rights, and that's kind of one of the buzzwords. It's a, it's a tagline. Yes, you know, companies will agree to do the right thing because in the end, it's in their long-term best interests. Well, yes, sort of. And maybe in a way that can be recognized by shareholders and maybe not, and maybe in a way that, in, that is recognized according to the legal duties of their officers and directors and maybe not. Um, for some of the things that we talk about, yes. For some of the things, no. And so it's a combination. It's a combination of making the business case, but also um, making sure that communities are, have, um, have the legal support and backup, um, are unified, um, and under, you know, have, have, have a clear understanding of their rights and what they want out of a process, um, and, and using the leverage that comes to hand. Um, and building alliances with people on the industry side, like potentially, for example, APICA, um, and people who understand why this provides long-term value for companies and also enables companies to sort of o obey the triple bottom line. <laughs> well, thanks a lot again. Well, we already heard a lot of interesting issues, a lot of different avenues. I would like to turn now to you, the audience, whether you have any questions to raise to our panelists. Please, Ingrid. Um, very, very interesting presentations and quite in-depth and good and useful. Um, and just three things. Um, Jonathan, um, obviously my experience is that sure, the grievance mechanisms are absolutely critical where they are appropriate, but in certain places they want to test their own system and the integrity of their own judicial system like Vietnam, uh, like Myanmar. Um, and so we wouldn't want to be replacing that. I was just interested in your comments on that. Um, and uh, Zuzan, um, obviously Bangladeshi Accord comes out of Rana Plaza and um, I'm sure every lawyer in this room and beyond has been contacted by the Bangladeshi Accord saying, it's all great but we have this long line of disputes now and we've got no lawyers to, who are skilled to do arbitral um, you know, negotiations, can you help us? There's nothing in the accord that enforces, you know, helps. And so keen to hear your thoughts about whether you're twinning or helping in that position, um, given all the incredible experience you, you certainly have. Um, and uh, <coughs> Wolfgang, you mentioned best practice and you said you're promulgating it through your members. Um, I think everyone in this room who's attended, you know, Geneva, all the forums where business, big businesses come out and championed its, its, uh, its uh, CSR or sustainability programs. And what we find is that they don't share their best practice. And I'm keen to know whether you are, um, you know, involved in sharing best practice perhaps cross-sectorially. How many of your members actually take up the best practice? Um, that kind of thing. So kind of interesting. Thank you. Who would like to start? So on the question of making sure that you're not replacing the opportunity to test and strengthen and build experience in local judicial systems, um, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> um, you probably assumed that I would agree. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, at, at least at Earthrights, we've always our, our, our mantra has always been, in a case involving multinational interests, you sort of, you follow the money from the local to the global and you try and identify mechanisms and ways to pursue justice at every, at every stage of the way. Um, and just different things are going to work with different actors. Um, so, you know, 
because this is a community design process, it, you know, I don't get to prescribe the elements that I would like to see. Um, but the first, one of the first stages of developing a grievance mechanism is figuring out which kinds of issues fall within it and which issues the community itself believes are more appropriate to be handled through the local justice system. Um, and uh, definitely, you know, we've heard in some situations people would say, you know, if it were in cases of things like rape, we would, rather than taking it to a non-judicial system, we would prefer to assistance in developing a case or developing a dossier or whatever it is, presenting it to the criminal authorities and developing potentially a civil claim for damages if that's, if that's applicable. Um, and so building, um, I would say, off-ramps into the formal judicial system is a really important and not very well developed area of grievance mechanism design. Um, so there's excluding some things from the grievance mechanism, but also steering a grievance mechanism into the formal system when appropriate or necessary. Um, you know, in, 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 in the Myanmar case, for example, um, the, the, the community that we're working with um, has very little faith in the local judicial system um, because it's been an instrument of oppression. Like it has just very expressly been a, an instrument of oppression for them. Um, they've been displaced new, a number of times without either with no compensation or practically no compensation um, through oppressive means in order to provide land and resources to a military that controlled the entire country. Um, it was done by decree. They had no recourse to the courts. Um, and so they say, um, they told us that they were at the point of sort of essentially going into full-on opposition to the, to the project because they didn't see any way through the existing structures to have their interests vindicated. Um, and when the idea of a, of, of a process that they were able to be part of the design of uh, came up, that gave them some hope. Um, and so I think that's one of the keys that a judicial system that has a history of, of, of repression, again, no input from the communities who are affected. In, in Myanmar, it was a repressive military regime for 60 years. No one has any experience of self-government or designing their own processes. And the idea of, of doing this for them was, 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 was really what, what gave them the sense that possibly this project could be something that brings them benefits instead of just more hardship. Um, so it's, 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 it's a really tough call. Um, but I, 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 I think there's a lot of room for interplay between these two things. Um, and I would expect that in a lot of cases, something that starts as a, as a company level grievance is going to end up in an ideal case at the, in the courts or in the administrative uh, tribunals or whatever it is. I will just uh, comment on the Bangladesh uh, Accords and, and uh, Rana Plaza, the famous tragedy of thousands of workers butchered in a building, uh, all main brands present, including EU brands, uh, members of the UN Global Compact, SAI certified, uh, no union in the Rana Plaza. Uh, complex or in, incredibly anti-union environment in the Black Bangladesh as part of the of the business culture. Um, we signed, I mean, the, the international trade unions uh, signed this, this accord as a legally binding um, agreement with the brands that they will um, support labor inspections in the garment uh, sector and then they will pay for, for the fund to pay victims, people heavily injured with uh, deteriorating health uh, directly linked to, 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 the, to, the, to, to, to the strategy. Uh, long story short, the fund uh, half empty and um, indeed uh, people left without, uh, without um, what is due to them. Um, difficult to say uh, about uh, what to do with this uh, next, apart from re reiterating that, that the business uh, accountability has to be put more strongly in the framework of the state's responsibility to provide uh, with the right re uh, to remedy. And uh, uh, mm, 
Um, one of the ways, and one of the new ways maybe, is to use more comprehensively public procurement for that, meaning that making the access to public procurement conditional on the corporation's uh, due diligence, um, providing with the, uh, let's say, like grievance mechanisms, remedies for violations, human rights due, due diligence uh, mechanisms, and extending them through the supply and subcontracting chain, and just to mention that that uh, it's such an such an uh, such that such an policy response would be now um, possible uh, under uh, the EU public procurement directive. Um, public procurement is mentioned in the employer's sanction directive. Uh, as a sanction for, for uh, to to um, uh, employers irre uh, employing irregular migrants, including victims, for instance, of trafficking or severe labor exploitation, as well as such policy response would be now possible um, under the WTO revised agreement on government procurement that uh, came into force in 2014. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, you want to. I, I st I'm still uh, there. Uh, I would like to answer your question. There are two points actually in it, which I realized. Uh, one is the big uh, problem. Uh, one side is saying CSR is more of a marketing gag of the industry, which is a, a fair statement. Uh, and in order uh, to really find out what it's all about, I, I always say, I have to encourage the civil society to really focus here to via NGOs to challenge the industry, whether this is now all kind of industry, not oil and gas industry, challenge the industry as civil society. Uh, challenge their results, challenge their, their reports, challenge the, tra the transparency. So there, the ro there, there is a role, and I tell you at home, I have two daughters, they are, around, they are about 20 years old, and they challenge me a lot. They used to, to, to live with me in other countries. Uh, they, they know what it's, uh, what it's all about there, and they challenged me a lot. So I see it at home, and I would recommend very much to all of you to challenge the industry, because only if the civil society is active, uh, is a thinking society, even uh, only then the industry will improve uh, in, in terms of sustainability. The second uh, question was how many members uh, do implement these, um, these manuals. Uh, I would say, um, of course, we, we cannot force our members to do that, uh, but I tell you the, 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 the actual setup of CEOs uh, in, in the big oil companies of this world, they have very much understood that without following uh, the, the UN uh, development goals, without following the guiding principles, they will not be successful. Simply not successful. So uh, it, it, it is the point, and, and that's a community side, if you have already spoiled uh, the relation with communities, like it happened uh, in, in, in big parts of South America, you have a big problem. That's really a big problem. On the other hand, where you can start from scratch or where you will take the leftovers of Asian companies, uh, it's relatively easy for our member companies uh, to work uh, and, and uh, to implement the best practice exercise. And here I have the example, uh, I can tell you this of Iraq, uh, and, and that is something uh, where I learned a lot uh, because in Iraq, uh, the, the, uh, the northern Iraq part uh, was meant to be for the smaller companies, companies like OMV, companies like Mol from Hungary, small companies, not the big uh, one, and the western companies. And I found that uh, they, the, the approach of these uh, small companies was very much appreciated because, and, and this is, is clear, it, it's evident, they did not want to make any mistake because the big fish are always taking uh, the money out. So the small companies very much stick to all of, of these uh, recommendations. So, and, uh, and the result eventually for the local communities uh, was, I, I would say there was not one case 
uh, so far, uh, not, not even in front of court. Uh, and so obviously they did their homework well. But not everybody is doing his homework well. Thank you. Karin, yeah. you've been interrupted. Just, just one, one thought to, to Ingrid's question on the danger of non-judicial remedies replacing judicial remedies. And, and Jonathan also mentioned that in the case of Papua New Guinea, the communities having the choice between no, rem, no compensation and that the form of compensation that the company uh, uh, provided, of course, uh, they took what, what, what they got. And this is very, very understandable. Um, so I think from as a temporary measure to, f to fill a gap, uh, this, is, this is sort of okay. But um, the danger is that, that we try to replace the responsibility to protect human rights of the state by strengthening the remedies pillar. And this is never going to work. The pillar three can never replace the pillar one. So actually this is for me a, a warning signal that you mentioned that there was no judge for a year. Yeah? This is the, a warning signal that other avenues must be used to, to, to pressure the state to really implement its, its state responsibility to, to protect human rights yeah? through the universal periodic review, through peer pressure of, of other states and so on, and civil society. Uh, the, the remedy pillar will not be able to solve that. I'm afraid. Not, not the best model, not uh, you know, whatever we can envisage uh, in our discussions. Thank you. Further inputs from the audience or questions? Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank all the panelists for your insights and your contributions. So my name is Andre Di Maelig. I'm a law student at the University of Vienna. And my question is for Mr. Wolfgang Kraus. So you mentioned something about human rights violations in uh, Sudan. Could you please elaborate on this and how did uh, OMV get involved in this whole thing in the first place? Um, as I told, OMV bought the company once uh, uh, and then was uh, accused of being involved in, in, in human rights violations. Obviously, uh, it was about security uh, guards uh, who were uh, treating the communities not in the right way, but in the history. So that was a, a, a case which, which OMV was informed, but uh, we then, uh, of course, as I said, um, have hired specialists and we contacted human rights uh, people. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, um, there was no outcome of, of the case so far, and OMV sold the stake of this company. Again, they, they did not work there uh, any longer. They did not operate anything. Uh, it was just uh, a financial uh, stake of that. And, uh, to, to finish this, so sometimes it comes as a surprise. You have a financial stake in a company, and then from, from somewhere comes the accusation that uh, just because of this you are involved into human rights violation. That is new for business. And that was new for business. So it's good that we have forums like this and we discuss, discuss this in a multi-stakeholder forum. It's important also for the companies, for the managers. I address it you, to you and, and to your uh, field, uh, field of work because at universities you have to teach that. You have people to tell. You have to tell the student what it's all about. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. Uh, my name is Barbara Linda. I work at the Boltzmann Institute as well. And I would just like to share an experience, um, actually an, a bit an unsolved case. Uh, we did a case study on uh, core labor standards in Tanzania uh, in February. And we researched the respect of the core labor standards on tea plantations. And actually the situation in Tanzania is like that, that, well basically it was uh, within the framework of a big EU development project, of a FP7 project, and we wanted to assess multinationals impact on core labor standards. And so we're also very much looking at the fair trade standards at the Rainforest Alliance and whether these standards would impact the core labor standards. And what we found in Tanzania, we had three companies um, we, that opened like the doors for us and um, two were certified. 
and one was owned by uh, an Indian owner who was not certified, who actually opened very uh, generously everything, all the fabrics, and he just didn't care whether we found anything or... Yeah, there was a big difference between the certified and the non-certified one. Um, the situation was that way that um, the trade unions were actually there, um, but they were not, they didn't have the capacity, and they were also kind of a bit corrupt if we had the impression. What the trade union did and what was very good is they um, set up kind of women's commissions, um, and they were very strong, and they represented the interests of the workers. But um, there were like other problems because many workers were casual workers. They were not employed, so they were not represented by the trade unions and not covered by the whole system. Um, so the trade unions would have some kind of entry points but didn't get a grip on the workers. And the fair trade and the Rainforest Alliance was very good in selling for the European market, but actually didn't really trickle down to the workers. So what they did is they did these women's commissions, which were kind of effective. But um, yeah, for us it was interesting to see that whether trade unions nor corporate responsibility <coughs> initiatives were very effective. Actually, it would need an enforcement of labor laws and more tripartite dialogue. Is there anybody of you who wants to react to this comment for Barbara? Or are there any further questions? Yes, please. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Lambert uh, Asemota. I'm from uh, African and Ethnic Minority Advocacy Center. Um, my question goes to Mr. Wolfgang Cross. Um, there are situations when you have uh, 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 a three party uh, arrangement. You have the state, you have the community, and then you have the, uh, the oil company. And then the uh, state grants the oil company uh, oil explore exploration license or extraction li license within a community. And the co because of uh, maybe uh, corrupt dealings, the community is uh, uh, adversely affected by oil spill within the environment and they have no control over what happens within their environment, and they, they cannot go to the state because the state has uh, 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 gone into some covert uh, arrangement with, this, uh, uh, with the state because of uh, cor corrupt dealings. So in such situation, what happens to the community that, uh, that have no control over such, uh, uh, to change anything? They are just living there and their life have been uh, destroyed because of oil spill over the years. I'm actually from Nigeria, and uh, this is more like a practical thing that I have seen over the years. We know wh what happened between uh, BP and the uh, American government because of the spill that happened within a short time. I know how much that was spilled out because of, uh, I don't know, within a few months of oil spill. But this has happened for over 50 years in Nigeria. So I want you to throw some light on that one. Um. I think we, we are touching here a, a very important uh, point, uh, uh, and, and it's, it's a historic, it's a big historic mistake, definitely, uh, and, and it goes back really to time when we had no responsible business uh, in parts of the world. Uh, and this, this goes back, uh, this is a historical, uh, for me, as I see from my experience, uh, is a historical point. Uh, because we have to see the overall historic development and wealth of the West versus the rest of the world. It did not start in Nigeria. It started already hundreds of years with many, many other things before. And actually we are, hopefully we are uh, now further advanced in our overall uh, way how we treat the world. Uh, I would not nail it down on one company, I would not nail it down to, to the oil business, I would not nail it down uh, on, the, on the any other fashion business or you name it. Yeah? It's about the overall ethical behavior. And uh, the point is, what I saw, and this is my optimism, and that's why I'm always optimistic in giving my view also to my family and my children, that I say, 
Actually, I see, I see the sun on the horizon because a lot of people have understood that the way we treated the world, the way we treated each other, uh, this has to change and is going to change. And now I, th I see people sitting together in, at the OECD. Uh, I see these clever, smart, educated people from the African Union. They're challenging us, the oil industry, very much. But they are very, very supportive, supportive in implementing reasonable uh, ways forward. And you are absolutely right. It's not acceptable that government taking the money, uh, that government uh, are corrupt and uh, taking money not for the communities and not for their people, just taking for themselves and their cliques. Uh, that's not acceptable. And I tell you that uh, the, uh, I would say our member companies are well aware and uh, our member companies have sometimes decided in the last year not to go into certain deals because of this. But now in OECD, together with World Bank, together with your countries, there is a discussion going on uh, how to solve this step by step. The point is, it's not uh, until tomorrow, it's not un in, in five years' time, it's a step-to-step -step approach. Our children will be involved and our grandchildren will hopefully uh, then finish the exercise. Um, yeah, thank, thanks, thanks for your intervention. Uh, and um, I, I think, I, I, to a certain extent, I think I share Wolfgang's opt optimism, but I also see it a slightly different way. Um, First of all, in terms of the, the theme of this panel, when you have collusion between, active collusion between the company and the state, uh, most likely a non-judicial company-based grievance mechanism is not going to get you to, uh, to a solution. Um, and I think that's, that's actually really where panel, where the, the first session comes in, that's where transnational justice is incredibly important. Um, and certainly, you know, you know in the example of your own country, um, that some communities have gone to the U.S., they've gone to the U.K., they've gone to the Netherlands, following country, countries home to file claims there because they don't have faith in their own system to handle it, um, and they see that collusion and, uh, and that problem. So the need to keep, keep the courts open for that kind of thing is really important. Um, and I should just say as a, as a, as a brief corrective from, from the previous panel, despite what uh, the honorable judge said, um, in the U.S., it is still the case that you can sometimes you can sometimes hold parent companies responsible for things that they were involved in, um, and the avenues have not been all closed down by the Supreme Court. Um, but I don't think it's it's not it's not just historic. I wish it were just a historical point, um, but I mean you know major multinational companies are entering into exactly these agreements still. Uh, they're still fighting transparent, ma manda mandatory transparency tooth and nail in the United States that would shed a light on these financial dealings. Um, the, you know, you, Global Witness is exposing things like the OPL 245 scandal in Nigeria where Shell paid a billion dollars knowingly, indirectly, to the, a former um, oil minister and state governor um, in order to get control of an oil block, and that happened in the last, in the last decade or so. Um, so the need, the need for hard accountability is, is there and, and transnational justice as a backup to national level justice is, I, I don't see a replacement for it. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for raising that. Well, thanks a lot. Actually, this was a very nice concluding statement of our panel. I want to thank all of you here on the, on the panel. We had a lot of really good discussions and I would like to thank you for, for listening to us, for discussing with us and contributing. It was a really good discussion and